Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the show. And as you can tell, today we are joined by a very special guest indeed. A lot of you may know her best as Isadora from the hit show Motherland Fort Salem. Today we are joined by Emily Leclerc. Oh. Emily, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. I'm really good, Sam. Thank you for having me. That's great. No, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. Um, I always get heavy requests for like a lot of sci-fi based shows and mm -hmm. I know Motherland Fort Salem has such like a die-hard fan base so it's awesome that you are the first guest we've had from the show so thank you so much for joining us. Well my pleasure I mean yeah the fandom is so special we really feel the love and we receive it and we hear it and we see it and and so it's my pleasure to give back and you know answer some questions today. Awesome. Um, so obviously we will talk about Motherland, but I'm going to kind of tease the fans and I'm going to make them wait just a little bit because <laughs> I'd really like people to get to know you first. Um, so how did you first start in acting? Um, I started in high school. Um, I, I was probably 15 years old. Um, there was an elective course I could do in probably grade 10 or 11. So I think the first play I did, I was Lady Capulet in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> I was already playing the mother figures uh, back when I was a teen. Um, yeah, so I, I did acting in high school. And then after that, I actually... Uh, did a degree first in international development studies and English literature from McGill University, and then, and then I kind of gave my uh, undergrad diploma to my parents, and I said, "Now I want to be an actor." <laughs> and I moved to Vancouver to attend um, a conservatory training program. Yeah. Awesome. You know. So, did you when you first started? Were, were you more kind of? Whether it's experience or mindset, did you have an idea whether you were kind of more swayed towards theatre or whether you always kind of wanted to go into screen acting? You know, that's really funny because looking back, I didn't have the, um, I never imagined myself so far into the future. My only goal was to be accepted into a theater school. That was it. That was my dream. It was just to get to that school. And then after I completed the school, I'm like, okay, well, what, what's the next step? And then it was to work and to work for such and such company and to work for such and such company. And then once that happened, I'm like, okay, what's next? And I've always loved television. Um, I, I grew up in French Canada in Quebec. So I wasn't exposed to the same television that most English speakers were. So like we had our own programs. But I remember being a teenager and having like two shows to watch per night. And so just, yeah, it was kind of a, I fell in love with it, uh, with Motherland. And now I just want that again. Yeah, I really love uh, TV acting. I also love the stage. Uh, I just like to be stretched into different directions and to be challenged as an artist. So, um, yeah. You know, it's it's always crazy when I, I mean, I, I always will give a massive props to screen acting because I think screen acting, I still think is quite a underappreciated art because I don't think people quite understand like the challenges people can have with like camera shots and it, I know there could be maybe retakes but you are still very capped at what you're kind of you have to do within this box but this I always say to people like the concept of doing theatre work like terrifies me to my core I have no idea how people like could do theatre work like night after night after night um so how did do you feel kind of very comfortable and natural doing that kind of thing yeah, so you're bringing up really interesting points. I feel like film acting or TV acting, like on-camera acting, you can't lie because the camera is so close. So whatever the character is experiencing, you you are, you know what I mean? Like it has to be very personal. It has to be very like internal almost. Um, I mean, different stage actors approach the work differently. Um, but I know that my TV work has informed my 
my stage work now. So uh, I I did Henry V last summer. I was in, in Barn on the Beach, which is a, well, a Shakespeare festival here in Vancouver. And uh, it was so interesting to have to do those, those same like really intense and emotional monologues night after night and to have to do them like 60 times in a row and to have that, to try to find that same truth every night because your audience is different every night and you owe it to yourself as an artist, but also to people who are coming to be as truthful as possible every performance. So it's kind of a different muscle and um, I'm really happy I, I, I went back to the stage last summer uh, and now I can't wait to be on camera again because you only do a scene like five times. So it becomes, it, it stays raw. It stays raw. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to be pushed. It doesn't need to, you know, it stays so truthful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and those, those points you kind of talk about there. And I, I kind of always say for people listening to this, that maybe are hoping to break into the industry um, even if it's in film and TV, because I think a lot of the generation maybe have that concept that they'd love to be in this big hit movie or hit TV show, right? That's the dream. Um, but I do think theatre work would exercise new skill sets that you could develop into your screen act and vice versa. So I think that's yeah. your, your kind of point is, is perfect there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I did. I did basically only stage acting for the first 12 years of my career. And then I had the chance of, you know, being on set for three years with Motherland. And then going back, like, I really think I'm a stronger actor now that I've been on, on set um, and, and vice versa. I think, I think the craft stays the craft. And the more that you do this art form, the better you get to know yourself and the better you can become at acting, I think. <laughs> yeah absolutely um so a bit about you personally um please correct me if i'm wrong but i i believe i i've read places that you've done quite a lot of traveling um yeah, I have, yeah. so could you talk to us a bit sort of about traveling aspects that's kind of a new area that we don't really get to talk about yeah well before i call it my previous life like before i moved to vancouver and focused on acting in my mid-20s i i traveled i backpacked through multiple countries. I also, so yeah, so I did a degree at McGill University in International Development Studies. And um, I volunteered, I did three months of volunteering once in El Salvador, working with, um, with uh, yeah, like working with a community in the country, planting trees. And then three years later, I worked with an indigenous group of women, Nobe Bugle, on a Nobe Bugle reserve in Panama, uh, doing a project with them for three months. Um, and yeah, I also, part of that uh, degree, I, I, I did an exchange with the Australian National University. So I studied in Australia for a semester and backpacked through Southeast Asia. Um, I left alone that year. I was 21. I left alone with my backpack and I was gone for 11 months and it was pre cell phone area era. So the deal with my parents wa was, I'm going to send you an email once a, a week to tell you that I'm still alive, but like, I wouldn't, <laughs> They wouldn't know what was going on. And I backpacked alone in Southeast Asia, like in China and Vietnam alone. <laughs> so, uh, it was really intense. I, I got really sick. It was during the SARS epidemic. And I had just gone from traveling in the countryside of China. And then I was coming back to Bangkok and Thailand. And I got really sick. Uh, and I went to the hospital. And uh, they're like, you can't go because they, they knew I was coming from China and they thought like I had SARS symptoms. So they didn't want to let me go. So I was alone. So I had to call my parents in the middle of the night to tell them where I was. So that was a quite an adventure. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of traveling in my early 20s. Um, and I was studying international development studies. I've always been interested in other cultures, um, you know uh people's stories um 
So yeah, it was a, a really, a really formative time of my life. And I'm kind of happy I did that so early on. I think it uh, helped me kind of feel strong and feel like, you know, it kind of gave me a little bit of, um, I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Just like believe, like believing in yourself and mm -hmm. connecting to your spiritual self, even in a sense, because you're so alone, you know? Um, yeah. So that, that was, that was a really great, uh, that was my previous life, I call it. <laughs> and now after moving to Vancouver, making acting a focus, a full-time focus, mm -hmm. um, and I've traveled a little bit with plays. Um, so I created a show that brought me, um, that, that, that we performed throughout France. Uh, in 2017 then I co-created another show with the Australian um, theater for young people that traveled to South Africa and uh, wow. Australia so I had the chance to travel through some of my work as well which has been great that's amazing you know and I think you know there's something I always I've, I was always personally inspired to do some traveling and I think at such a young age and as well you you know you went to some really like what I think for for a lot of people that were backpack traveling you know, to do a lot of Southeast Asia and China, especially, they can be very like daunting places to kind of visit. And the fact that you did that so young and completely solo, and like you said, free cell phone era, which kind of makes it even more terrifying. I think that's, that's, in, that's incredible, really. I think. That's, yeah. It's, it's I got, at that age, I, I didn't understand why my parents were so worried. <laughs> and like now that I'm I'm the age that I am and that you know my nieces and nephews like I have a niece that's 16 years old you know what I mean like and I'm like oh my gosh like I understand why my parents were worried I would be worried <laughs> like, it was a crazy thing to do but honestly they didn't really have the choice I was going <laughs> yeah no, I think that's what a lot of parents also understand. I mean, the thing is, if they're going to be daunting, even if you just went to another state, let alone to go to arguably the other side of the world. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, do you feel that that traveling and like being able to absorb so many different cultures and so many different lessons, like you said, not just from other people, but to learn sort of about yourself as well. Um, do you think that's kind of shaped some of your work in acting? That's yeah, I think it gave me the resilience that um that the industry requires of people and uh always like moving forward and and you know falling on your face and getting back up and going again. So it takes a lot of courage to follow that uh that like any I think any any discipline like any artistic uh career is uh, a lot of like you know you, you need a lot of resilience so i think it taught me resilience and self confidence in in a way because i had none before yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely um so in and around uh your role in motherland so whether it's pre or post uh the show what do you have any particular real fond or standout moments that kind of stick in your head while you're whether performing or backstage or any experiences? I had a lot of fun. I mean, I think season one, I was like, I had a bit of a, like an imposter syndrome in season one. I was like, <laughs> this is like, do I deserve to be here? Like, are, are they going to fire me? You know what I mean? <laughs> like I was just so new to it all. And uh, I remember when we shot um, Libba's funeral in season one, it was really interesting because a personal friend of mine got cast as Libba's mom. So it was so fun because I was like, oh, I get to be on set with my friend. Um, and I remember Elliot coming to me that, that day. Elliot is the showrunner, just coming to me that day and, and being like, I really like Isadora. She's... Uh, you know, she's very interesting. And so that gave me hope that maybe Isadora would have a storyline in season two. So I re I'll never forget that moment. And like so many, so many little things stand out. Um, just having so much fun um, on set with, with Lynn, with Kat, with Demetria, with 
um, Taylor, with like everybody. It's so bizarre because some actors I just didn't really have any scenes with because the nature of television, right? Our storylines did not necessarily intertwine. Um, but yeah, so many fond memories, uh, so much fun. I think season two, I was really nervous for the uh, gas chamber scene. I remember I had prepped it really differently from from what they wanted. I, I thought like they wanted me to be scary. So I was like really like small voice, like really close and like almost like, and they're like, no, like you need to be bigger. I was like, oh, you need me to be theater big? They're like, yeah, <laughs> like you need it to. So I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, so that was fun. And uh, I mean, like the big fight of season three that day, was so visceral it's so bizarre because i i took no photos and i didn't take many photos throughout my experience because we had to be mm -hmm. careful about about that like yeah. uh, you know and so i i was a good student and i didn't take photos <laughs> and i'm like so sad because i don't have a lot of backstage photos but yeah the big like fight scene was so wonderful and the stunt coordinator was just such a wonderful human to work with and um yeah so i'll never forget that day and i was so stressed for the fight that i had to shoot a really small scene before and it's like i had forgotten how to act uh <laughs> the poor director came to me and he's like no just like be a bit more normal like just walk normally <laughs> i was so stressed because i knew that next we were shooting the fight and mm -hmm. uh, i really well you know i, I like I just, I, I had asked for a fight at the end of season two. <laughs> I put my foot in my mouth and I told one of the, one of the creator, I was like, you know, I, I, I work out a lot and I like, I have that energy. I think I want to do a fight if, if it works. So, uh, so anyways, and I, I only had two hours to learn it the day before. So I, I you know, the pressure was high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so that's actually was... something that, yeah, that's something that I really wanted to talk to you about that fight scene because that's always when I think of Isadora, there's a lot that always comes to mind about kind of the type of person Isadora is. Mm -hmm. But when I think about in particular scenes, that that fight scene, just the intensity of that fight scene uh, of what it is, um, and obviously the ending of that scene where sort of Isadora's laying in just like a pool of blood um for you did you expect the fight scene to kind of be as challenging as what it kind of appeared for viewers and did you kind of expect for it to go that way you mean in the execution of the choreography or you mean in the in the death part of it like the the the, the, the execution the... of the choreograph scene i would say oh okay uh well again i had an amazing team like the stunt mm -hmm. choreographer was just so encouraging and i think from because i did musical theater performances because i have done um movement-based uh work before on stage um you know <sighs> I, I don't know if he was just being encouraging, but I, I picked it up pretty quickly. So so it went really smoothly. And uh, I think they were really pleased. We only did like a couple of takes of each of my segments and then we were moving on. So, um, so yeah, so it, it went really well and I love doing it. So the way it worked is like, uh, there's a stunt double. So there was oh, okay. the, the, the hand um and she was amazing and she like she is um so all the hand fighting is a stunt double and and then all the sections where it's like from the waist up is me so I had like four little sections of uh, maybe 16 to 32 beats each to learn so yeah no it went really well I loved doing it I really did and I was so excited to fight that I kind of forgot god and i knew that like this was like episode nine of season three and you know at that point we kind of knew that it wouldn't be renewed so i was like mm -hmm. okay you know and then and then they came to see me and they're like well we want you in season in episode 10 so she's not dying and i was like oh 
So it was a really roller coaster of a day. It was a really roller coaster of a day. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, you know, that's something actually as well. So obviously, unfortunately, we knew it wasn't going to be kind of renewed for another season. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that if, let's say, the show continued, do you feel like that would have been Isadora's final scenes? Or do you think that was always the plan to bring her back? Well, I th I think they wouldn't have brought Isadora back in episode 10 if they were not interested in had there been another season in continuing mm. to work with Isadora, I think. Yeah. Uh, but I, mean, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, the world of TV is a thing where, like, things are changing so quickly. And uh, I'm learning. Like, we can't really take things personally. You know, it's not about... Yeah. It's not about us and our ego. It's about the story and whatever serves the story best. And like, yeah. I was okay with Isadora dying in, in episode nine, if that's what they wanted, if, if that's what, if that's the story we're telling, because, you know, as an actor, you, you're, you're just part of an ensemble. Everybody's mm -hmm. work is important, not just yours. Like, you know, like there's just so many people involved on a production like that. So, you know, it's all about the story we, we choose to tell. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it's nothing personal. It, it, it is just kind of that's how. And again, th those kind of things change at, at, at kind of the drop of a hat, really. You know, you yeah. see some people and I've, I've spoke to some people on shows that were only supposed to be in maximum of three episodes. And then they ran on to be in 20, 30 episodes and have a lot oh, of key yeah. roles and moments. And that was the case for Isadora. I went back in my email, uh, in my inbox, and found the breakdown for Isadora from May 2019. And uh, she was estimated at three episodes. Wow. And then yeah. how, how many was it? It was, it was somewhere between 18 and 22, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, Isadora, we, I was in, in 18 episodes, but, you know, I it was estimated three at the beginning so this has been like the biggest gift <laughs> that life has ever given me <laughs> yeah um so just in case some people maybe aren't overly familiar with the show um because we get people coming from all kind of different movies and shows so obviously isadora is a necro necro lab scientist for fort salem which might sound very strange if people haven't seen the show but it, it's a really cool character um there's always like this aura of intrigue with Isadora um obviously being especially ahead of a, a necro department um and something that I always have been fascinated with is how emotionless she appears consistently even in moments where she does things that are loving and caring and with like like caring intent um so for yourself how was it playing a character like Isadora? Oh, I absolutely love Isadora. I mean, I could play Isadora for years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Isadora is so smart. She's always looking at things with intrigue. Um, hmm. And yeah, I mean, she, you know, from an outsider's perspective, maybe her job's a bit morbid because she deals with, with death and with... Um, but she's she's a scientist she's curious she's um you know she's she's always looking for for answers and and i think that's great like yeah curiosity is such a wonderful thing you know and i think she's curious about all like biology yes but like all sorts of different things so um yeah i absolutely love playing isadora i don't really know if i'm answering your question though um no, no, that's no, that's perfect. That's perfect because I always feel like, I suppose a better way for me to put it really, is when you first sort of whether you auditioned for the role or whether the role was pitched to you, mm -hmm. how was Isadora pitched to you as a character? If that makes sense. Oh, I f I found the breakdown. I'll read it to you. Oh, awesome. um, I also ha I had decided earlier on that Isadora was okay with accepting death and accepting that we are um accepting death and accepting like 
the curiosity of what may come after or you know I, I think maybe emotionless emotion emotionless from the fact that yeah we're all I, I don't know like we're we're, we're all uh interesting and, and and things all happen for a reason I think so the the breakdown said uh that Isadora is a tall woman with a warm maternal force She's a very powerful witch, a necro teacher who's been summoned to restore life to a de dead youth that, that was Porter in, in scene one, uh, so that we can bear witness, um, you know, about his ma matter of, of death. So, yeah, so I think, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I kind of, I think every time you audition for a part, first off you kind of have to go with your gut feeling because you only have one or two days to prepare mm -hmm. uh and then you have to memorize lines um i don't know for me it was like almost like like a magical thing it was like an, an energy i just went in the room and i had like this this energy that i felt like so aligned with and then it just i don't know it just happened yeah that's that's amazing yeah i i always for me personally i really love this is one thing I really love about Motherland Fort Salem is they they explore. I mean, there's a lot of shows that are like sci-fi and witches and um, but I think the, the character breakdown that the show actually brings, I think is I don't think there's many sci-fi shows that do it as well. Um, and I think Isadora is a perfect example because you, you really don't get to explore these kind of characters um, who and, and I, I guess for you, it. it it's it's a question that's why I ask what's it like to play such a character because there isn't really any other show where you can kind of parallel Isadora to being like another character right from a different show so mm. you had to kind of although the character was created whether it's for you um you had to kind of bring your own your own kind of energy to the character so that's why I kind of think it's it's, it's kind of a, a crazy thing to have to try and play a character like Isadora Hmm. yeah I don't know what happened it just happened <laughs> uh but I think like Isadora's favorite thing is why trying to understand why and 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 trying to dig deeper and same with Penelope in season three like why is this happening like mm -hmm. okay if I do this will this happen you know what I mean so I think there's a uh, yeah it's like this beautiful curiosity that she has yeah yeah um was there any particular uh not cast member but character whether as if if you were playing Isadora or maybe yourself as as a fan is there somebody you would like to have seen Isadora maybe have a few more scenes with or have maybe a, a separate moment with well I mean I want I wanted three other seasons <laughs> <laughs> no uh no to answer your question I think it would have been really interesting to have a storyline with Scylla uh yeah just as a like a fellow necro you know and and just like explore what that relationship of student and um teacher could have been and what they could have created together mm -hmm. so i think i think that would have been fun yeah. yeah and and we i never really had a scene with amalia except the very first day i was on set <laughs> for season one which was the classroom scene when we when Porter is coming in and and uh, Scylla is in class right so that was the only the only day we ever had on set together oh. yeah oh wow um did you film um, I know obviously a lot of films don't film in sequence but did you film in any kind of sequence or was it completely as the days kind of went on yeah, usually we would we would do one episode every 10 days like every every two oh, week wow. We would do one episode. Sometimes we would do block shooting, especially during COVID when uh, some of our cast member had to fly in from the United States. And then, you know, there's the COVID thing, the testing. So um, sometimes it was easier to block shoot. So we'd take like four weeks to shoot two episodes. Um, yeah. Actually, and I, and I, I live in Vancouver. So for me, it was so great. <laughs> Yeah, it was just like down the street. I was going to work down oh, the street. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's something I, I didn't kind of think in the back of my head that you would have been filming during the whole COVID uh, pandemic that we had. So what was, how did you kind of 
find that aspect of it as well mm, yeah so covid hit we filmed season two and three with covid uh it was a little more more solitary like all of our lunches had to be in, in our trailers alone like no no nobody could mingle and uh you know we we're wearing like face shields and masks and we also were getting tested uh two to three times a week so wow. yeah the protocols were really tight and everybody had to you know um everybody on set had to test so it was really i mean i felt really safe in a sense because like the um the measures were so you know they, they were so strict uh, but mm -hmm. that was the only way that any production in vancouver could film was to abide by those measures so it was the same for other shows um yeah it was kind of so nice though when we were rolling camera because then we could finally see people's faces <laughs> because we're in masks and visors all day long and then all of a sudden we remove our masks and, oh there you are okay you know? <laughs> yeah it's very it's very and, and there's some people on set that I've never met without like like I remember afterwards meeting somebody that I had worked with on set but because for two years I'd only seen them in a mask I barely recognized them <laughs> It was very strange because like it's like, oh, I know who you are, I know about your life, but I've never seen your face, your full face, you know? So that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, because they, they definitely broke that kind of personal interaction with people with those uh the restrictions that everyone had. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's that, that's insane. It kind of it, it must be such a surreal moment to know you kind of worked with somebody and you've known somebody for quite a significant amount of time, I'd say. Yeah. But as you said, you've never actually really seen their face. Yeah. And then you barely recognize them because you're like, oh, that's what you look like under there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously with uh, the show Motherland, um, I know this year, I believe it was this year, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you attended a convention, which was one of your first conventions you attended for fans. Um, I believe it was called uh, Witch Bomb. Yeah, it was a Star Fury convention. Yeah. Uh, it was my very first convention ever. Um, and I loved it. It was uh it was a dream come true to meet the fans from all over the world. You know, people had flown from all over Europe and like Singapore and Japan, and you know, I mean, like people had come from all over. So um it was really nice. I had interacted with a few fans on social media. So to be able to be like, oh, that's who you are, you know, it was so great. Um yeah, it was it was really nice. And and um they only sold 500 tickets. So we got to meet people and chat with them. And uh, you know, I, I learned a few people's names by the end of the weekend, which was amazing. <laughs> so I feel very grateful for that experience. And uh, hopefully there's more in the future. Yeah. I mean, I saw some of the photos that they released because they always release photos. And I, I, I'm i not sure if they do videos, but I've seen the photos and it looked like an absolute blast. And I've been to some Star Fury events in the past and they always throw incredible conventions. And it that, it's like you said, because they only sell a capped number of tickets, um, it does make it a lot more personal. It kind of makes it feel like you actually you get to know the fans as well as the fans get to know you as a person as well. And they can kind of ask all the questions that they want and that they have. Um, so yeah, they it looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun. And uh, my flight was on the evening of my birthday. So by the time I got to London, I don't know, like everybody wished me happy birthday and they gave me these giant cards and then there was a cake and like, I'll never forget that birthday. That's for sure. Uh, it's the first time that so many people <laughs> wish me happy birthday. Uh, but yeah, no, to be able to exchange with the fans, um, it was during um, the strike. So the strike is now lifted, but um, we couldn't talk about the show. Uh, we couldn't wow. talk about the characters. 
Um, so we were invited as as guests and we were talking about our personal life. It wasn't really really the questions were not really related to the show. And mm -hmm. somehow it made it really personal and interesting. So yeah, um, yeah it was a great first experience. Yeah. yeah. And do you know what? I think although obviously I know some of the fans would have liked to have spoke about the show, um I I kind of I don't I don't know what it is personally, but I kind of quite like that they know you as a character and they know you from their favorite show. So they, they themselves kind of have that relationship with you. And mm -hmm. obviously then you get to kind of learn and understand them, but then they get to know a lot about you with personally. I quite like that. It kind of brings the community a lot more together, which is awesome. Yeah. And they're going to do a witch bomb number two next summer. And hopefully by wow. then you know, the guests will be able to talk about the show. So uh, fans will be able to ask their questions then. Yeah. I think we'll have to speak. We'll have to try and get Star Fury to book you for Witch Bomb too, because I think that would be pretty awesome as well. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of quickly going back to uh your personal life, um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, they're very general. Um, so I'd like to kind of know whether it's in acting or maybe just in general life, um, who or what inspires you. Hmm. I'm, I, ins I'm inspired by people with resilience and the people that are kind. <laughs> I know it sounds like, but, uh, yeah, I'm inspired by female leaders that are strong, that are at the top of their game artistically, but who conduct themselves with, uh, grace and, um, and lead with love and are kind and uh yeah i don't know just like in uh, amanda tapping became a producer of the show on season two and three and and she was that i was like wow she's she's just like you know she's just she's got so much on her plate she's dealing with so much but she's doing it with such love and kindness and grace and that was very inspiring um I liked, you know, in season one, Lynn Renee was my inspiration. Mm -hmm. Just again, like she's so kind. And 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 I was somehow a little bit like introverted, like kind of new to the business. So being surrounded by strong, amazing uh, women was was very, very inspiring. Yeah. Artistically, I I always like an actor that has a lot of range um, and that can do like gritty raw stuff you know um a big Matthew McConaughey fan I like Francis McDormand um and and just speaking about you know women who uh can lead like Margot Robbie is is inspiring I Jessica Chastain is I feel like I, I'm still I keep discovering amazing talent and uh those are like known names but uh, like Hannah Weddingham is a big is a big inspiration for me just because she's a tall strong woman and I'm like okay it's it's possible to have a space in this industry if you're a five foot ten woman <laughs> and if you're like us you know you, you're athletic like so and she's an amazing uh, actress and so kind so anyways those are kind of my inspiration and um but I think every day people inspire me just as much really like yeah yeah no yeah that's that's it and I think that's a that's a great thing with kind of when you get those moments where you start to feel inspired or you see someone's work and you get inspired is that it's it's forever evolving and you're always finding new sources of inspiration so yeah. like they could be somebody that brings a show or a movie out in next week and then all of a sudden that kind of that energy kind of can you can emit into your own personal life and then sort of grow from there as well um, so it's always important, I feel, to be inspired by people. Yeah. Um, so if you could have a very specific role or a type of character, and it could be any type of character in any movie you you like, what would kind of be that dream role for you? Mm. I think I'd like to, I mean, Isadora was so serious, you know. I I think I'd like to try, like to dip my toes in comedy just to see. Uh. 
<laughs> somehow Popular like, a, like, an ensemble, like an ensemble type show uh a little bit like brooklyn 99 you know like like that kind of yeah. energy i i i would like to 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 try that we'll see we'll see if it ever happens uh but on my little bucket list my dream list i really want to play a detective uh awesome. i really want to play a, i want to want to be a lawyer <laughs> and i would really like to be a villain on a cw type show <laughs> a superhero <laughs> action figure villain so not even a hero you'd love to be the villain <laughs> i want to be the villain that looks like more fun though and have a lot of fights. I mean, the, the the this is my dream list. Hopefully, it happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to you have to manifest it. You have to put it out there to the universe. Well, that's why I'm saying it out loud. Then you know, maybe it'll just happen. <laughs> no, but those comedy shows, like like you said, Brooklyn Nine Nine, that like just from a fan perspective, they I'm sure they're really really challenging sometimes, but they just look like so much fun. Like it looks like every day and every scene would just be laughing and joking and fun yeah. oh. they look so easy but i think doing comedy i think doing comedy is is really hard yeah. It, i yeah it's really hard be, because like yeah i don't know so i i think i would like that challenge at some point yeah absolutely um you know i i definitely think because i always say with comedy is timing and um you know I think as well, working in one-to-one -one maybe, I, I don't know if it'd be usually maybe one-to-one -one or as like a group. Um, I suppose a group, maybe you can bounce off each other. But if you were doing one-to-one -one comedy, I think that'd be really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you have any upcoming projects or anything coming up at all? Right now uh, that the strike is over, I'm just focusing on auditioning and, uh, you know, ho hoping to uh, tick something off my... Uh, dream list <laughs> yeah that's my my focus i'm gonna be directing a show a, a play uh for little ones in the spring and it's a play about witches so <laughs> i'm staying in my wheelhouse yeah it's gonna so follow you now for the rest of your career there's always gonna be like every year there's something to do with witches <laughs> witches or mushrooms you know like one or the other um no, uh, so I'm excited for that. I really like to work with uh, with actors. I really like um, that work. So um, so it's it's exciting and it's a, it's a fun play. Um, so um, and it's around uh, the character La Bifana, which is like an Italian folk tale. So yeah, no, I think it'll be fun. It'll be a different kind of challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it. That sounds amazing. Um, do you have any kind of social medias or anything where maybe the fans can kind of keep up to date with your life and they can maybe follow your social media pages? Yes, they can follow me on Instagram and I think X. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm hesitant because I, I'm not super present on social media. I'm really trying to get better. Yeah. And it's I'm hard. at M underscore... Is it Leclerc one two three? I think. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, I'll make sure I'll make sure it'll be at the very top of the you'll, description you'll make so people can right? find it. Yeah. No, it, it'll yeah, be at I the very people, top link. I love people following me or reaching out saying hi. I love that. Um, and yes, I'll try to be better at posting. No, it, it's <laughs> it's sometimes it feels like it's its own job keeping up to date on social media. It can be such a hassle sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Emily, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It has been so wonderful to be able to talk to you about you, about your career, uh, about Motherland as well, which has been super fun. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sam. It's been my pleasure.